Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Benjamin Applebaum. Ben is the lead writer on business and economics for the editorial board of the New York Times and previously a Washington correspondent for the Times, covering the Federal Reserve and other aspects of economic policy. Ben is also a returning guest to the show and therefore is a proud owner of a nominal GDP targeting mug. Ben joins us today, though, to discuss his new book, The Economist Hour, False Profits, Free Markets, and the Fractured Society. Ben, welcome back to the show. Thanks very much for having me. All right. So you've been using your nominal GDP targeting mug? <laughs> I have, yeah. It yeah. holds coffee very well. Very nice. Very nice. So you have a new book, The Economist Sour. It's an interesting read filled with lots of history, and it reflects your training as a historian. Is that right? I mean, my background uh, as a college student was in history. It may be a little strong to say that I'm a, a historian, but I have a longstanding fascination with history. I think it's a really important way of understanding the present. Yeah. So lots of stories, lots of fascinating stories. There's an overarching theme to it as well points are made. And and we'll talk about some of the areas where maybe I view things a little differently or interpret things differently, some of the facts, but still a very interesting read. Recommend our listeners get a copy of it. And it really reminded me of a book that I read when I first got into economics or my, my interest was stoked. And I think there's some parallels I want to share with you and see what you think. So I had had some economics courses in college. I really liked them. It never dawned on me to be an economist as a career. Went back, was working on my MBA, and I picked up at a used bookstore, William Greider's Secrets of the Temple. And you actually cite that in your book. Use some of the material in your book, I can see. I really loved that book. Even though I didn't agree with all of his conclusions, I thought it was a fascinating read because the history was so rich. He had all these inside accounts. And I, I kept thinking of that book as I read your book. You had all these fascinating stories, lots of history in it. Um, you know, again, I had some different takes on a few things, but... How, how do you feel about me comparing you to that? I, I mean, I love Greider's book. And what I love about it uh, is I think a lot of history ignores uh, economics and a lot of economics ignores history. And uh, those two ways of looking at the world, I think, are, are sort of intimately intertwined. And I really appreciate Greider's ability to, you know, to narrate the complexity of, of history to say, you know, basically, this is an economic story and it's a historical story. It's about people and it's about money. Uh, it's about the intersection of of, of economic and historical forces. Uh, I think he does that really well. Uh, and the other thing I really respect about Greider's work and try to emulate in my own uh, is that he really tries to bring economic policy decisions down to the level of ordinary lives and to say this is how uh, the economy plays out and economic policy plays out at the level of ordinary people. Well, you do a great job in your book, too, telling lots of stories like that. Now, why don't you get us started by telling us kind of the, the big picture story of the book, the argument. What's the summary of the point you're trying to make? Yeah, this book is the history of a revolution that begins in the late 1960s and the early 1970s, uh, where economists begin to become a lot more influential in shaping public policy and thereby reshaping uh, life in America and then around the rest of the world. Uh, it's a specific kind of economist who comes to influence in those years. It's people who believe very strongly uh, in in market forces and the idea that the government should step back from managing the economy and allow market forces to allocate resources, uh, deregulation, uh, minimizing the role of fiscal policy, uh, getting out of the way and encouraging free trade and globalization across a whole range of policy areas, some more unexpected than others. Uh, these economists are advocating a fairly simple answer to the questions of the time. Uh, if the economy isn't working, the solution is for government to, to step back and get out of the way. And so it's the story of uh, who those people were and, and how they came to hold those ideas and how they came to convince policymakers that they were right. And you argue it came at a cost, right? Yeah, I think that it's a, a story of a revolution that goes too far. I think uh, in the 1970s, the economy was breaking down in part because of problems in our approach to economic policy. Uh, and many of these ideas were correctives to those problems. Uh, and they worked to some extent. They uh, were beneficial uh, in, in the early years. Uh, but the embrace of those ideas went too far. Uh, and I think there were three primary consequences. The first is... Uh, we didn't get the prosperity that we were promised. Uh, in the long run, uh, we're seeing growth slow in part because of disinvestment in the economy, uh, which I think 
can be traced directly to the ideas of these economists. Uh, second, inequality soared. Uh, one of the key arguments that these economists made was that you didn't need to focus on distribution. You just needed to focus on aggregate growth. Uh, and and our indifference to distribution is one big reason that that we have a lot more inequality. Uh, and then the third the third consequence, which is connected to inequality, uh, is I think that our democracy is being strained in part by the fact uh, that we now have less and less in common. The idea of we the people, of a common and collective purpose, uh, is harder to define and to defend in an era when uh, you know some of us have such vast wealth and and most Americans have have very little. Yeah, and just so we're clear with our listeners, you tell a nuanced story in the book. You, you, like you mentioned earlier, you do recognize the gains, the the progress that's been made. You talk about globally the world's a better place, but in the U.S. there's been these challenges that have arisen because of these developments. So it's a very nuanced story. Um, and again, I encourage your listeners to take a look at it. What has been the response to your book? So yeah. tell me about that. So I want to emphasize that it is a story. I mean, my hope in writing this was to write a historical narrative that would be interesting and useful, irrespective of what conclusions you draw from it. So you've asked me about the conclusions, and I do get to those in the book. But I think even if you have a very different view of what this all meant, just the story of this revolution and how it came to pass is enormously important uh, and illuminating uh, and, and I think valuable. Um, but yeah, so the reaction to the book, you know, has been all across the spectrum, as you might expect. <laughs> there are people who love it and, and people who don't. Uh, I'd say in general, it falls into a couple of categories. Uh, there are people who think that I'm overstating the role that economists have played, uh, in the evolution of, of America, American society, the American economy. Uh, the extreme formulation is that I'm blaming the weatherman for the weather. Uh, but even people who are willing to acknowledge that economists played some role, uh, some have argued that, that I'm attributing too much responsibility to their ideas uh, and too little to the various powerful forces that uh, embraced their ideas or made use of their ideas uh, in order to change, uh, to change our policies. Okay, very interesting. Yeah, I've seen some of the response like on Twitter. I've seen both praises and then some, some pushback. So it, it's worth reading, though. Again, I encourage the listeners, even those who might be skeptical, my fellow economists. I mean, yeah, Ben does poke us a little bit in the book, but take a, take a chance and read the book. It really is interesting. I think you'll learn some fascinating history. Again, there's a great story to be told there. Let me share my big thoughts on the book. And then I, I want to get into the stories you tell because some really fascinating stories, Milton Friedman, Robert Bork, others, some really great stories I want to get to in the time we have today. Um, but I want to begin with what I consider maybe my big takeaways from the book. And the first one is the title of the book, The Economist Hour. And you kind of touched on this when you were talking about some of the pushback. And I might have come away thinking a bit more of the University of Chicago's hour or, or a certain type of hour. And I, and even that's not correct because you get in the supply siders who really weren't all University of Chicago, Chicago type economists. Um, but there were other economist hours, and you, you mentioned this in the book, like the, the post-World War II era. I mean, the Keynesian paradigm became very dominant. They began to feel the government. They played a role. In fact, you even mentioned in the book that this revolution was kind of a counter-revolution to the Keynesians, right? So is this more of a, a story about the, the free market hour versus the economist hour? I think there's two uh, important points that I try to make in the book. The first is that our historical memory of how important the Keynesians were in shaping public policy uh, is greatly overstated. Okay. I, I think because of the prominence that economists now have in public life, people look back and assume that the advocates of Keynesians' I ideas had similar prominence in their era and were similarly influential. And, and I think that's just not the case. When you look back at who was making economic policy decisions in the mid-century uh, and what ideas they were drawing on, uh, economists were marginalized uh, by comparison with the present day. They were not the central decision makers. Their ideas were generally not decisive in these debates. They existed. They talked a lot. They wrote a lot. We still have the things that they said uh, on our shelves. Uh, but but Keynes, uh, certainly in the United States, was largely ignored in his own time. Uh, his disciples really struggled to influence public policy in the succeeding decades. And the impression that we have that that one uh, school of economics simply replaced another school of economics, I think, is wrong. 
Uh, the shift in the late 60s and early 70s is not just the replacement of one group of economists with another group. It is really the first time that economists gain that degree of centrality. So that's number one. Now, it's true that the people who came to power uh, in this era – uh, were a different kind of economist than than the people who had preceded them. Uh, uh, they were much more, uh, uh, you know, c- convinced of the virtues of markets, uh, much more concerned about the role of government in the economy. Uh, but here's the second point, is that I think in the retelling, uh, it is convenient for a lot of people to insist that there was some type of, you know, great debate between these economists and their opponents, uh, uh, liberals versus conservatives, uh, to map it onto the politics of the time. Uh, and that is true to some extent. There, at any moment during the last half century, one could find, you know, one could map economists and find a split between the liberals and the conservatives. But what gets lost in doing that is the extent of the consensus, the degree mm-hmm. to which both liberal and conservative economists came to agree about a certain number of very fundamental and important things. For example, the centrality of monetary policy and the need to focus monetary policy uh, on keeping inflation as low as possible. Uh, They agreed, my paper, the New York Times, ran an editorial in the mid-1980s advocating for the elimination of minimum wage laws on the grounds that we had surveyed all the prominent economists of the day and found no one who thought that minimum wage laws were a good idea. That's not a Chicago school thing. That's a all economists thing. Uh, and, you know, there are professional surveys from that period in which economists were asked for their thoughts about, you know, the, the value of tariffs. They thought there was none. Rent control, terrible idea, you know, opening up free trade, great. I mean, you can go down a list of important ideas that shaped our economic policy in that period. And I think that, you know, people tend to focus on the things that remained controversial because that's where all the heat was. Yeah. But it's important to step back and look at the things that weren't controversial because those actually constituted, uh, you know, the vast majority of our economic policy. Uh, and on those issues, economists had achieved a very high degree of consensus. Okay. So another takeaway for me is you're touching on something important. And I think for me, at least, the prima facie evidence is the rise of populism we see. So there's some kind of there's angst out there, not just in the U.S., around the world. So something has happened. Um, and, you know, you you look at in- inequality a lot. You focus on that measure a lot. But, but one of the things I was thinking about as I, as I read the book, what if we solved inequality. And to be clear, you don't say eliminate all inequality, just kind of the excess. And that's, we can debate what that means. But there's always going to be some inequality, just different natural endowments, life, life is unfair, things happen. But to, to reduce it, you want to reduce it. But some of the challenges I think I see are, are more than just inequality. Put, put it this way, if we got rid of inequality, would we still have some of the underlying questions of identity, place, agency? I think absolutely. I mean, to be clear, I think inequality is a positive force. It it has real benefits. It's the incentive to work and to achieve and to uh, advance yeah. new ideas. So this is by no means an attack on inequality as such. Uh, it's just true of inequality as of many things that they're best in moderation. Uh, and that if you have too much, uh, you start to encounter a lot of increasingly, uh, increasingly great problems. But yes, I, by no means do I think that inequality is the only problem confronting us. And indeed, I started with something else, which is uh, my view that one of the profound consequences of this era uh, is that the systematic denigration of government's role in the economy has handicapped our growth prospects. I think of the 1990s as a very interesting period in this respect. It's remembered as sort of the last time that the economy was working really well. I think what people miss about the 1990s is the extent to which that prosperity was founded in public investment in earlier decades. Uh, the United States entered the 1990s with the most educated workforce in the developing in the developed world uh, and with a wealth of, of innovations and technologies uh, that were ready to be implemented broadly uh, and to increase productivity. Uh, and on the back of that, we enjoyed an era of great prosperity. But during the 1990s, we were systematically disinvesting in education, systematically reducing our investment in technology and research. Uh, and the consequence is today that, that we don't have those same advantages. We no longer have anything like the most educated workforce in the developed world. We no longer have this steady conveyor belt of innovations that are ready to transform the economy. Uh, and I think that that is a profound consequence uh, of this era that has not Nothing to do with inequality per se, uh, but has everything to do with the way that economists reshaped public policy. Yeah, you mentioned earlier this sense of a divided nation we have now. 
you know, are we truly united? Can we be truly united? And uh, it, it is seem like a challenge. I mean, it, the country seems very polarized. Even you know, people I know, you know, there's very strong views held, and one does wonder where how we get from here to there. Let me speak to some of the achievements during this period here. So I know some of the pushback you've got is that there has been some good accomplishments, and you do mention this in your book. Again, I want to be fair; it's a nuanced story. You mentioned how billions lifted out of poverty. But it's not just billions lifted out of poverty. I mean, I have a Brookings r- report here how half the world is now middle class. So I mean, that, that's a pretty remarkable accomplishment that happened during this time. Along these lines, Andrew McAfee has a new book called More From Less, a surprising story of how we learn to prosper using fewer resources and what happens next. And his, his argument is the U.S. economy is dematerializing. So we're using fewer resources to produce the stuff that we, we do, we use, we can consume. Cell phones are a good example. And he, he gives the illustration of how, um, you know, you take a Radio Shack ad from the 1980s, there's like 15 items on there that are now all apps on our phone. And we often talk about, and I've seen this before used in the context, it's cheap, everything's cheaper now, we're much better off. But he goes and takes the analogy a step farther. He says, look, it's not just that it's cheaper, but there's less stuff, physical stuff. We don't carry boom boxes around, CDs, you know, some computers, cameras, it's all on the phone. So we're physically using fewer resources. So it's an amazing accomplishment. And he says this starts actually in 1970s. So where we're, the U.S. economy is dramatically doing better in terms of the environment, climate change is still a real struggle, real issue. Um, so we have that. We have all these people lived out of poverty. And that seems like a remarkable accomplishment. And, and could it have happened, I guess, is my question, in the absence of the cutthroat capitalism that you describe in the book? So I think uh, the transformation is real. My, my son has this Richard Scarry book, this children's book with, you know, these pages that, that show objects and, and their names. And there's this shelf in a, in a kid's room and it's got, you know, the, the record player and the radio and the books and, the, <laughs> and none of those things exist anymore. It's just a phone now. So all those objects have been condensed right. down into a state. So that's, that is a real and undoubted uh, transformation and obviously hugely beneficial. This is not an argument against change. I, I think the change was good. The question is, how do you manage it and what role uh, should policy play in managing it uh, and in managing the distribution of the benefits? Uh, the pace of change, I think, is enormously important as a policy consideration. The distribution of benefits and of costs. These are the issues that policymakers essentially stopped grappling with. Uh, and decided that they were just going to let the market sort it out. And I think that was a huge mistake. Uh, and then, obviously, the second question is, well, would this have happened? Would we have had the same degree of change uh, if we had been taking this more hands-on approach? Uh, and obviously, you know, counterfactuals are very difficult. Uh, right. It's a hypothetical world, and we don't know exactly what it would have looked like. But I would point out again that the roots of that change are in an earlier period in which the government was playing this role in the economy. One of the stories I tell in the book uh, is about the invention of the transistor. Uh, when the transistor was invented by AT&T, by Bell Labs, its research facility, the government required AT&T to share that technology with its competitors. And within months of the invention of the transistor, AT&T held this remarkable conference in New York where its main rivals and smaller companies were invited to come learn in detail, not just what a transistor did, uh, but how to make it. And then they issued a a textbook, a a recipe, uh, which was known as Ma Bell's Cookbook by a generation of electrical engineers, because it explained exactly how to make this thing, this incredibly valuable new technology. What happens is that, uh, you know, engineers from Sony take that idea back to Japan and start making transistor radios, which are the first great uh, commercial uh, electronic product of the modern era. Uh, Texas Instruments shortly perfects uh, silicon transistors, uh, which is the first step in the personal computer revolution. Uh, The government forced the sharing of this technology, wrote rules for the marketplace in a way that it later stopped doing. And so when we come forward and say, you know, well, would we have cell phones uh, if the government had intervened uh, in the economy, we wouldn't have cell phones if the government hadn't intervened in the economy. Fair point. All right. So what would be your prescription moving forward? So I'm jumping to the conclusion of your book. And we'll, again, we'll get to the, the specific chapters in a minute. But how would you have policy address these challenges that have been created by this counter-revolution? 
there's no silver bullet and and you know the book takes the form of a, a series of chapters discussing different aspects of economic policy and for each one i think you know the answers are different and i don't pretend to have all of the answers this is primarily a work of history okay. uh, it's about what went wrong and and how we fix it i think is a is an important and central question that i'm not presuming to answer in this book but in general i would say the following thing markets are human constructs they don't exist outside of government the idea of the market as some natural thing that orders itself is is ridiculous uh, and our task the task of our policymakers in particular is to write good rules for markets uh, to consciously set out to craft rules that will promote prosperity uh, and that will distribute that prosperity in the way that we as a society regard as best. Uh, and those are conversations that we need to start having again. Uh, and and uh, that is the role of government is is to do a better job of writing those rules. That will be your next book after we have implemented <laughs> all these policies, right? You'll do another history on how we dealt with the challenges of dealing with the, the consequences of the counter-revolution. All right, well, let's get into the specific chapters. I'm going to start with the first few, and I really enjoyed them because they dealt with Milton Friedman a lot. <clears throat> He's almost like a central figure in this book, so I'm not sure if you're painting him as uh, just a pivotal force or a hero or a villain. How would you describe his role in this whole I mean, I think he's the most important economist of the 20th century. I okay. think he had this incredible influence across a remarkably wide range of areas uh, in, in reshaping uh, the role of economists in society, in reshaping our conception of, of what econ economics is, how it should be done, uh, uh, its interface with policymaking. I, I just view him as this giant figure who loomed over the landscape, somewhat underappreciated, I think, in his own time. Uh, notwithstanding how prominent he was as a public figure, but the degree to which he uh, exercised, you know, sort of a, a gravitational force over the rest of the discipline, I think, is quite remarkable. Yeah, you mentioned in there how certain left of center economists came around to like him, support him, endorse him, say, hey, this is a Friedman world. Yeah, if you had asked economists uh, who they regarded as their most important peer for much of the 20th century, I think Paul Samuelson would have probably been a leading answer to that yeah. question. He was often portrayed as sort of, you know, the great man of his own era. What's remarkable, if you take, you know, Paul Samuelson's economics textbooks as an example, is the degree to which he successively rewrites them uh, closer and closer to Friedman's ideas over the course of the century. So people saw him as the representative of the mainstream and of conventional wisdom, and that's fair enough. But the fact is that Samuelson conceded many of his great debates with Friedman over the course of the century. Yeah, and in, in my area, central banking, monetary policy is very true. His legacy is central banks are run in the way he would have envisioned. I mean, they don't target monetary aggregates, but the same principal ideas that they're very much the center force in terms of countercyclical management is kind of his prescription. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, the idea that monetarism lost, I think, is just, uh, it's wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, he may have wanted a more rules-based approach, but his, his, his views, I think, are very much with us today. And I want to go through some of the history of him because it's really fascinating to, to see his role. So the first few chapters get into this, but you also touch on him throughout the book. Um, but it was interesting to read about him and his role in the draft. I've heard this before, but I think it's a story worth telling. And he himself, I think you said, saw his work on the draft as one of his biggest accomplishments in his career, right? He did. He said that it was the, the thing that he was most proud of, uh, even to the end of his life. Uh, having done so many other things, uh, had a profound influence on public policy in so many other ways. And I start the book with this story because I think it's fascinating. Uh, it happened first. It's the first time that Milton Friedman uh, really successfully uh, puts his stamp on public policy. Uh, and it captures much of what follows. Uh, and by the draft, we're talking about military conscription, the, the fact that in the decades after World War II, the United States government annually required tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of young men to serve in the military. Uh, and it chose them, you know, in a bureaucratic process that was basically regarded as optimal. The idea was that the government would decide who should serve in the military. Local draft boards would sit in judgment uh, and decide which young men in each community should serve their community uh, as members of the military. Uh, and Friedman and his allies come along as early as the 1950s. He's making this argument, but it begins to gain traction in the 1960s. And they say this is wrong. Uh, it would be better in several respects, more moral, more economically efficient, and better for the United States militarily 
uh, instead to pay people to serve in the military, to say to them, basically, we will pay you as much as is required to hire as many soldiers as we need, uh, and and it will be an all-volunteer force. And instead of drafting Sergeant Elvis Presley and requiring him to serve his country, uh, Sergeant Presley can go pursue his singing career, uh, and someone else will be paid to serve in that role, someone who is excited about being a soldier and for whom that's the highest and best use of their time. Yeah, so I got to read an excerpt from your book where he has this interaction with General Westmoreland, who was the Army Chief of Staff and, as we know, a very famous figure in the Vietnam War. So I want to read this. It's it's wonderful. He was very witty, sharp on his feet. And that's one thing about Milton Friedman. Till the very end, he had a sharp mind and um, productive life. So I'm going to read this, page 40 and 41 in your book. It says, A defining moment came on a Sunday morning in December 1969. Gates invited the heads of various branches of the military to meet with the commission. General William Westmoreland, the Army's chief of staff, regarded the commission's work as an assault on the Army, the only branch of the service that relied on conscription. Quote, I do not relish the prospect of commanding an army of mercenaries, Westmoreland told the commissioners. Freedmen, smelling blood in the water, responded, General, would you rather command an army of slaves? Westmoreland, I do not like to hear patriotic draftees referred to as slaves. Freedmen, I do not like to hear patriotic volunteers referred to as mercenaries. After all, in that same sense, I'm a mercenary professor who has his hair cut by a mercenary barber, his ills taken care of by a mercenary physician, and his legal affairs handled by a mercenary lawyer. And, if you will pardon me, you, sir, are a mercenary general. Wow. <laughs> he would be one tough person to debate or to, to handle an exchange of ideas. There's a famous saying about Friedman that it was best to debate him when he was not in the room. <laughs> Right. Well, I'm sure General Westmoreland learned that lesson very well after that ex- exchange. But his his work on the draft is an amazing story in itself. You also mentioned, inter- interestingly, that the New Deal saved him and his, his wife from being unemployed. They were you know, pinching pennies. They were finding it hard to get work during the Great Depression, and the New Deal put him to work. Yes, it did. Uh, that was the one time in his life that Friedman worked for the federal government. He, in later years, resisted various opportunities to come to Washington and to serve again. Uh, but in those early years, he was, uh, you know, he worked in the machinery of the New Deal. Uh, in some respects, uh, seems to have aligned himself intellectually with some of the uh, the views of the New Deal on economic issues. Uh, these, This is when he was quite young, of course. Um, uh, but it ended up being a formative experience for him, primarily in the sense that it informed his judgment that, that the government was the wrong answer to pretty much every problem. Um, but the draft is a fascinating episode for another reason, which is that, you know, one of the the things that I set out to do in this book and didn't know how well I would succeed in doing was to trace the path of ideas from the minds of their originators into the law uh, and into okay. society and to see, you know, how well one could establish that, uh, that economists and their ideas had actually been the force that reshaped policy. And in the case of the draft, it, the record is remarkably clear and complete. We can watch the reasons uh, that economists articulated for opposing the draft march from Friedman uh, to uh, to the Nixon campaign uh, in 1968, be embraced by the candidate, uh, and then watch, you know, the new administration uh, push them into law step by step with Friedman playing a role sitting, as you just read, uh, on the commission that uh, advised the president on these issues. You can really watch economists reshaping uh, the government's approach to a key public policy issue and doing it in a way that really created a template for their transformation of other areas of public policy. You also mentioned in the book that Friedman early on was concerned about inequality, it, right? It, he absolutely was. He and George Stigler, his great friend, uh, you know, acknowledged. I, I think it was impossible. Uh, inequality was generally acknowledged as an issue uh, in the 1930s and the 1940s, and it was impossible to be addressing issues of public policy without uh, acknowledging the dimension, which was how does this affect inequality. Uh, And Friedman did something very interesting in those years. He and Stigler, the one paper they ever wrote together was a pamphlet on the evils of rent control. Uh, And in that pamphlet, they wrote this passage that said, basically, you know, inequality is an important and legitimate uh, issue for public policy to confront. This is the wrong way to confront it. 
uh, and the Libertarian Foundation that was funding their work flipped out and uh, put a footnote in the pamphlet without their permission that basically said, like, look, even these two bleeding heart liberals uh, think rent control is a bad idea, (laughs) Uh, which infuriated Friedman and Stigler. But, uh, you know, at that time, they basically had to acknowledge the legitimacy of inequality as an issue that falls out of their writing over time. The extent to which they actually regarded it as an issue in the 1940s, I think, you know, is, is hard to say, but it certainly was something that, that it was impossible to write about public policy without uh, addressing that question of, well, how does this affect inequality? Okay, well, let's move on to Friedman's work with monetary policy and making money matter again, taking it seriously. So many of the listeners may be aware of his famous work on the monetary history of the United States, which again, another interesting little tidbit I learned from this. It was actually commissioned, I believe, in 1949, and he said it would take eight months to write, and it took him 14 years. So, wow, that's that's a almost a you know two decade a decade and a half project. So that was an amazing story. And initially, they weren't thrilled about the direction he was going to take it, right? So the the commission came from, uh, you know, from a, a foundation that was headed by an, an economist who was of this older school, uh, you know, sort of uh, Keynesian aligned. Uh, and and the view at the time was basically that what mattered was not the quantity of money, which became, you know, Friedman's famous uh, argument, uh, but but velocity, how frequently money was used in the economy was seen as really the central issue. Uh, and what this foundation wanted was a study of velocity, a study of, you know, uh, how frequently money was used and how that related to the business cycle. They were seeking data on what they regarded as a basic tenet of of uh, macroeconomic policy. This is the early years of macroeconomic policy when the theory had advanced far beyond the very limited supply of data. And people were looking to sort of begin to ground their understanding of the world uh, in numbers. And so uh, uh, they turned to Friedman uh, and Anna Schwartz, his great collaborator, and said to them, basically, can you uh, look into this and document it? And Friedman, from the outset, made clear that he had no intention of fulfilling the, the, uh, the request. <laughs> he wrote back and said, basically, you know what, I'm, I'm interested in a very different question. I, I disagree with your premise. I'll take your money. I'm going to do a very <laughs> different study. Nice. Uh, and off he went. Uh, and, and he set out to prove something very different, uh, which is that velocity and, and therefore the government's role as, as a spending force. The government's fiscal policy basically was impotent uh, and the focus of, of macroeconomic policy was necessarily on, on the central bank and on the quantity of money. Yeah, and you really illustrate well how he was a lonely voice, a voice crying in the wilderness. Watch money, watch money. But, but most people didn't take him seriously for a long time. And you, you mentioned kind of the, the peak or the turning point in this counter-revolution. It's often often called the monitor's counter-revolution. It was his 1967 speech at the American Economic Association meetings. So tell us about that turning point, why it was consequential. So what's remarkable about Friedman's early career is that he was highly regarded as an economist, but not for this work. Uh, his early contributions were in statistics, really down in the engine room of economics. And he was regarded as rather brilliant in that respect. People held him in high regard. And so they were willing to listen listen to what he had to say about this other issue, but no one took him particularly seriously. Uh, They thought that he was crazy uh, and often said so in as many words. Uh, But uh, what happens over time is that Friedman begins to win little battles, begins to make small points, begins to use his model to successfully predict what's happening in the economy. Uh, And over time, people begin to embrace this idea that, okay, maybe the quantity of money matters. Maybe monetary policy is more important than we were initially acknowledging. Uh, But to his great frustration, they embraced this as just another tool of activist government policy. If monetary policy matters, they they conclude that this is another way for the government to to boost uh, employment during periods of, of, um, you know, slack in the economy, that you can add monetary policy to the toolbox of Keynesian activist economics. And so Friedman, who becomes the president of the American Economic Association, goes to deliver his presidential address, and it's a direct rebuttal to this view. Uh, He goes and he says, basically, you guys are misunderstanding what I'm saying. Uh, It's not that monetary policy can be used to fine-tune economic conditions. We basically, you know, we're making policy in darkness, and the most that we can do is just to, to steer a steady course to increase the money supply at a steady rate, anything more than that is bound to be counterproductive. Uh, That's the most that we can do that will be good for the economy. 
Uh, and this whole effort to build, you know, uh, a system of controls and levers and activist management of the economy is misguided and counterproductive and will produce the wrong results. Uh, and there's a very technical model behind all of this, which remains influential. Uh, but but the bottom line point that he's making is that government needs to step back and acknowledge its limitations in the face of uncertainty uh, and adopt a disciplined and minimalist approach to macroeconomic policy. Yeah, so monetarism becomes uh, more widely accepted. And I don't know if it reaches a, a peak or reaches kind of the height of its influence with in the early 80s. Uh, here in the United States, Paul Volcker invoked it, at least some form of it. Now, some have argued that it was a ruse to, for political reasons. He's going to target the the, the uh, monetary base so that rates could go really, really high, kind of give him cover. Um, but other places tried it as well. So, so how successful was monetarism in the early 80s? So I think, first of all, people who think that Paul Volcker embraced this purely as a ruse should, in the first place, listen to Paul Volcker's own testimony on this subject. And in the second place, read more of what Paul Volcker said at the time, because uh, it's pretty clear that that he took this set of ideas seriously, if not in exactly the form that Friedman had articulated them. Yeah. Uh, Volcker was was, was raised up uh, in a tradition of economics that was well outside of Keynesianism. Uh, Princeton, uh, where he studied as an undergraduate, was a place where Keynes had made no impression whatsoever. Uh, and he subscribed to this worldview. I think that's very clear. But uh, the adoption of this premise that monetary policy ought to be the the central or even sole lever of of macroeconomic policy, you know, it, it becomes universal. I mean, it's enormously influential. The exact mechanism of focusing on the quantity of money proves uh, essentially impossible in practice and is largely abandoned in favor of inflation targeting. And some people view that transition as the death of monetarism. I take a very different view. I think Friedman's central point that a central bank needed to keep things very simple uh, and maintain a steady course and minimize its interference in the economy, these ideas essentially prevail. Uh, and inflation targeting is in some sense Friedman's triumph. Uh, and and in that period, and therefore I think you know really the peak of his ideas is is not under Volcker in the early eighties, uh, okay. but in the nineties and into the two thousands when inflation targeting becomes the dominant paradigm of monetary policy. Well, that's an interesting way of looking at that. So even the the short term high was actually surpassed by a longer term shift and how central banking is done, which was premised on his his view. So that's fascinating. Now, you mentioned in the book several banks that tried this, and you alluded to this. Velocity was not stable, but the Bank of Canada tried it, Bank of England, the Bundesbank did it even longer. In fact, they had it as, as part of their mandate up until the, the European Central Bank comes along. But there are these velocity problems. So you know, the, the use of money would, would swing back and forth, which goes back to the original paper he was supposed to write, right? Yeah. What happens to velocity? Which I'll put a little plug in while we're here. That's what nominal GDP targeting is all about. One way to look at nominal GDP targeting is it's a velocity-adjusted money supply measure. Um, but put that to the side for the time being. Um, it is interesting that that kind of was the death knell of the, the apparent um, use of monetarism. But your point is it still kind of went under the radar and manifested itself as in inflation targeting. So he still won the war at the end of the day. Yeah, at least until the Great Recession. You know, he, he certainly, uh, <laughs> he was winning at that time. Yeah, and I, that actually raises a question I meant to ask earlier. You know, the, the book is The Economist's Hour, and maybe partly Milton Friedman's Hour. But is the hour really over? I, I know there's all this, you know, attacks and some stigma that economists have taken on and rethinking economics. But I look around, it still seems like economists are pretty influential. Or is it, wh how do you take that or see that? Uh, it's, I mean, undoubtedly, it's true that economists remain very influential. But I think, you know, that 2008 is an inflection point. And over the last decade, as in the 1930s and the 1970s, we've seen uh, uh, a period in which the certainty about a particular approach to economic policy has been profoundly shaken. Uh, it's undoubtedly true that its influence remains uh, in many ways pervasive, but there's a, a questioning of basic assumptions, uh, a consideration of new ideas and openness to new approaches uh, that I think marks a period in which, you know, something fundamental has changed and what exactly emerges from it remains unclear. I, I have no doubt that economists will be part of whatever comes next. But this era in which, uh, you know, the faith of economists in markets and the faith of policymakers in economists was essentially universal and unquestioned. I think that that era has closed. All right. Well, I want to go back briefly to Paul Volcker and the, the great inflation and his war on the great inflation. 
and the Double Depression in the early 80s. And you have a whole chapter that's titled One Nation Underemployed. And I think the key takeaway is that too much was done. The, the battle fought was too hard. Could have been done easier. It needed to be fought, but maybe a little gentler touch. Is that right? I, it it is the premise, and I think that you know whatever one thinks about how Volcker handled the early 1980s, whether you could have gotten to the same place more gently. Uh, what I think is even more important is the period that follows under Alan Greenspan, uh, in which the Fed places such a priority on minimizing inflation that it is uh, tolerating an unnecessarily high level of unemployment. There's a remarkable episode in which Greenspan goes before uh, a congressional committee and testifies that he is sure that, you know, 2% inflation is better than 3 and 1% inflation is better than 2 and no inflation is better than 1, that each of these steps down towards zero will improve economic conditions in the United States. In assertion for which he privately concedes to his colleagues, he has absolutely no evidence. Uh, and indeed, to this moment, we have absolutely no evidence. And, and so he's advocating for the sort of absolute minimization of inflation at the expense of higher unemployment. Uh, you know, it, it becomes a fetish. It becomes a religious conviction that less inflation is always better. And the cost is that millions of Americans remain out of work. Um, and that, I think, is, is what I mean when I say that the revolution went too far. It was clear that the Fed needed to take firmer control of inflation. Uh, it was clear that what was happening in the late 1970s was suboptimal. Uh, but by the 1990s, uh, the Fed is doing it in a way that also goes too far. Well, you know, I've been critical along those same lines the past decade. Yeah. And I think maybe what we saw the past decade of low inflation is the straight jacket created by that that journey down. But l let me go back and, and maybe play devil's advocate for Alan Greenspan and, and the Fed during that period. I mean, how do we know what the counterfactual would have been like if they hadn't gone down that path? And how do we know that unemployment, you know, truly was, you know, at a level that could have sustained a little more easing without, you know, creating problems for inflation. I mean, how, how, com put this way, how confident are we that an alternative path could have been taken successfully? I think that the counterfactuals, as we said earlier, are always difficult. We don't, we truly don't know what, what an alternate version of history would have looked like. What we can say with confidence uh, is that the Fed in that era saw its mission as focused on inflation reduction and was willing to tolerate higher unemployment than it regarded as absolutely okay. necessary uh, in order to achieve those inflation, those opportunistic disinflations. Uh, uh, you know, each time the economy crashed, that its focus was on inflation. It did not see unemployment as a separate objective. It saw it as a subsidiary objective, something that, you know, you would maximize by focusing on, on low inflation. Uh, there are, you know, papers that have been written calculating that delta and trying to estimate, you know, how much more inflation, uh, how much more unemployment than necessary the Fed tolerated. Uh, but I think, you know, what we can say with confidence uh, is that the approach taken by policymakers uh, did not regard uh, making sure Americans had jobs uh, as an equal priority alongside uh, minimizing inflation. Well, you're a great person to be thinking about this and, and asking this question because you covered the Fed very closely yeah. <laughs> during this past decade. So you've seen this firsthand. And one of the critiques I've had is that I, I think the, the Fed, and not just the Fed, but I think central bankers in general, maybe it's a human cognitive bias, but we think in terms of growth rates, not levels. That, you know, if we get close to 2%, we freak out as opposed to thinking about where we should be or could have been. And, and I say it might be a, it's a human condition because back in the 1930s and 1936, I've mentioned on the show before, the Fed began to tighten policy because they're worried about inflation taking off in, in the 1930s. And there's still this huge hole in the economy. They're thinking about a little inflation as opposed to where the price level would have been had, had there been no Great Depression. And it just blows my mind that back then they would be thinking about that. But then I come to the present. Well, maybe it's not so strange that they're thinking the same thoughts today. And maybe it's some hard wiring in our brain that we just have to somehow get over. But what are your thoughts after working closely on this for the past decade as a 
Fed reporter. Um, so I think the idea that we we have anchoring effects is is very real and and pretty well documented. Yeah, I mean, listen, I think the Fed was too cautious over the last decade. I think that you know a fear of inflation and to some extent a fear of political consequences inhibited their willingness, even as they began to rethink the importance of unemployment and to focus on unemployment as something that the Fed had both the ability and the responsibility to reduce. Uh, it was still the case that they moved too cautiously, that they were afraid of, uh, you know, a specter of inflation that never really materialized. They continually, repeatedly, year after year, overestimated uh, how much inflation would come into the economy, uh, that they, as a result, underestimated how much stimulus they should be providing to the economy. I, I should step back and say that I think the role of monetary policy in our post-crisis travails uh, is overstated because it was the only part of the government that was actually functioning. Uh, and so there's a broader story here as well about the terrible mistakes of fiscal policy during these same years. Uh, but is, as regards the role of monetary policy, uh, it seems clear, uh, and indeed the, the protagonists have said as much, that, that there was too much caution and, and not enough action. Yeah, so what do you think going forward is going to happen to the monetary policy in the U.S.? And I asked this with the observation in mind that interest rates around the world are going down. So traditional monetary policy may be very limited in the next recession, may have very little to do at all. Imagine the 10-year getting close to zero, you know, it's below 2%. Do you see more coordination between fiscal policy and monetary policy in the future because they're forced into a corner, really can't do anything else? Whether it's explicit coordination or just a recognition that fiscal policy needs to play a larger role, I don't see another way out of our predicament. I think that, you know, we have reached a point where, you know, the ability of monetary policy to be, you know, the sole manager of, of our macroeconomic issues has just, you know, it's run out of steam, basically. It's so clear that monetary policy is limited uh, in its ability to confront these problems and is increasingly trapped in this world of low interest rates. That the, the need for some alternative conception of how government interacts with the economy uh, is central, um, and I think we're seeing people grapple with it, uh, and and both trying to expand the limits of what monetary policy is capable of, but simultaneously to acknowledge that you know there's just not unlimited room uh, for monetary policy to operate, uh, and what emerges from that is fascinating, and will be the result not just of theory but of political context, right? Yeah, no, I, I hope it's something thoughtful, systematic. We've had several shows on helicopter drops here. And that's my worry is it's we're going we're gonna to hit a crisis. It's going to be ad hoc, make it up as we go along. It's not going to work well. One big mess as opposed to let's thoughtfully think through ahead of time whether it's you know bigger automatic stabilizers or my preference would be giving the Fed the ability to do some fiscal policy in a crisis. But well, let's get back to your book. I, I got distracted there, <laughs> Current Monetary Policy, because you have many more chapters and we don't have a lot of time. But I want to move on to a chapter called Representation Without Taxation, and this is the supply side story. So Robert Mundell, Art Laffer, Jude Winiski, tell us about them and the role they played in this revolution. Robert Mundell is sort of one of the great forgotten figures of 20th century economics. I mean, obviously his fans know who he is, but his centrality to two of the defining uh, sort of economic policy revolutions of the 20th century is – I think, uh, an amazingly uh, obscured story. So he he's the guy who basically dreamed up uh, the euro. Uh, and he's intellectually the father of, of what we call supply-side economics, of the idea that, you know, the best approach, uh, initially the best approach to stagflation in the 1970s uh, was a combination of, of tax cuts and strict monetary policy. Uh, that emphasis on tax cuts uh, as a stimulative force uh, is embraced during the 1970s uh, by uh, by Republicans and and in fact by Democrats in that period as well, uh, and and comes to be seen as the dominant mode of fiscal policy. The idea that you basically uh, can deal with your problems by cutting taxes, uh, that reducing marginal tax rates in particular, uh, which is a modification introduced by his disciple Arthur Laffer. Uh, you know, is the best way to stimulate economic growth. Uh, and the story of how they convince uh, the Republican Party to embrace that set of ideas is, I think, you know, a fascinating chapter in this history of, of the march of ideas into public policy. Well, yeah, it was interesting to read how they worked with Jack Kemp and some other Republicans and how Milton Friedman and others kind of collaborated out of necessity, not because they agreed with them in theory, right? Right. It was a, a marriage of convenience and... Um, and one that Friedman, in particular, never liked or fully participated in. Right, right. And and even Reagan, I'm sure, wasn't completely sold on all the ideas they had, but it was a convenient arrangement. Um, 
I think Reagan's history, I'm not a historian of Ronald Reagan, and I don't want to overstate my confidence, but I do think that there is some really interesting evidence uh, that has come you know, to the fore about Reagan's own intellectual involvement uh, in these ideas and the degree to which he really came to believe them and to understand them and to make them his own in his own form. Uh, in particular, you know, he gave these radio broadcasts during the period between his time as governor of California uh, and as president of the United States, in which he articulated a fairly cogent and sophisticated economic philosophy, including a commitment to supply side ideas uh, that I think really, you know, sheds new light on on the caricatures of Reagan as as, you know, sort of a political opportunist or as someone who was uh, used by some of his advisors. I think when you read those transcripts, uh, which he wrote himself, you get a different sense of who he was. He was a true believer. I think he was. Okay, fair enough. Um, But they had a lasting impact, you argue, in the book, right? The lasting impact was the the big deficits, or was it something else? I think it it is it, on several fronts. I mean, I think it contributes to all of the things we've talked about. Uh, the the flattening of of the curve and the restriction on government revenues uh, limited the ability of the American government to play a constructive role in the economy, to invest in infrastructure or research or public services. Uh, it it increases inequality. It reduces the government's role as a counterweight against inequality. It reduces the extent of redistribution. You move from a world in which the wealthiest Americans are paying more than half of their annual income to the government in the form of various taxes uh, to a world in which they're paying you know around a third of that income. Uh, that's a big shift in terms of the government's role as a counterweight. Uh, and as we've talked about, I think that has consequences uh, for the functioning of our democracy. Let me ask this question. Um, it's related to this. Some of the budget deficit growth, this would probably be after Reagan, so maybe more in the late 80s and definitely in the 90s to the present, but some of the budget deficit growth can be attributed to the demand for safe assets. So this is a hobby horse I get on often. In other words, it's easy to run budget deficits because the world's knocking at the U.S. door, begging for debt, offering really low rates. It's an endogenous response to what's going on. So to what extent do you see, you know, that the problems you've just outlined being kind of made enabled, made easy by what's going on in the global economy? So that becomes uh, a central factor at several points in this story. You know, the Reagan, one of Mundell's great insights uh, is that uh, you shouldn't think of a budget deficit as a constraint on domestic economic activity because we can just borrow the money from other countries. His initial example is Saudi Arabia. By the 1980s, it's really Japan. And the Reagan administration, when it begins to run large deficits, there are still old timers there who are concerned about the consequences. And then they discover to their delight, it's this amazing episode, that that all of a sudden Japanese buyers are snapping up these bonds. And they literally pass a law creating a new kind of treasury bond uh, that's easier to use to cheat on your taxes in other countries. Uh, and then they go market it in Japan. Uh, they embrace this trend. So there's no question that the, the availability of, of foreign capital transforms domestic fiscal policy uh, and does it again in the 2000s, uh, in part because of a sense that safe, we need to be a supplier of safe assets, which is uh, specifically part of the rationale for not getting rid of the federal debt uh, in the early 2000s, but also because the availability of that foreign capital just enables us to live a lifestyle that otherwise would be unaffordable. Uh, and to be clear, I think there is something to these ideas. I mean, the United States does have this singular benefit and ability to do that, and it shouldn't be dismissed out of hand. And I don't think the argument for higher taxes is necessarily that you want to get rid of uh, you know, that debt. Uh, the argument is that it creates a higher baseline. Okay. And in Chapter 8, you kind of touch on the story. When you talk about the money problem, you get into the history of the international monetary system, which touches on the U.S. being this supplier of safe assets. We don't have time to get to that chapter um, but I, I do want to touch on a few other points in the book. And again, I encourage the listeners to buy the book, read the whole book for yourself, because we don't have time to cover everything. But you have a chapter on the value of life. So, so give us the punchline from that chapter. I, I think that one of the sort of the great and the part of the book that I find most interesting, frankly, uh, and and was least familiar to me. Uh, is the role that economists played in reshaping regulation, in reshaping the way that the government approaches regulation, both by uh, essentially ending this extended period in which the government was actively involved in what's called economic regulation, price controls, determining you know how much of things could be sold and where and how, really convincing government to stop doing that, 
uh, and also reshaping the rising force of health and safety and environmental regulation. And the big thing that happens there uh, is the advent of what's called cost-benefit analysis, meaning the systematic consideration and quantification, generally in dollar terms, of the costs and benefits of proposed regulations. And if you're going to start quantifying costs and benefits, for most regulations, the biggest benefit, or at least for most of the most expensive regulations, the biggest benefit is going to be the number of lives that you're saving. Uh, and so the central question becomes, how do you place a value on human life? Uh, and I, I frankly think the story of how they did that, of how that idea emerged, uh, is just one of the most fascinating narratives in this book. And it becomes important, as you mentioned that chapter, because all these different government agencies emerged during this period or thereafter, Department of Transportation, EPA, OSHA, and they have to look closely at this question, right? Yeah, it's a defining question. If you're going to decide, you know, how safe cars should be, uh, how much pollution should be allowed in the air, uh, you know, how what what safety restrictions should be imposed on consumer products, these questions all basically come down to how much money the government should require private industry to spend to preserve a given number of human lives, to limit the number of deaths caused. Uh, there will be some deaths. Uh, you know, people don't... One of, one of the great debates in this period, when this begins to happen, when the government begins to say, okay, we're going to be explicit about this calculus, some people object and they say, oh, no, human life is invaluable. Uh, it's, it's a moral outrage to, to place a price tag on life. But the truth is, it's inherent in the process. When you write a regulation, you are making a judgment about the value of human life. What economics uh, allows and, and forces policymakers to do is to think about it explicitly, to weigh those costs and benefits, to say, is it worth requiring car makers to spend an extra thousand dollars on stronger car roofs? Well, let's figure out how many people that's going to save. Uh, and then we're going to need to make that decision based on a, a value judgment about how much those lives are worth. Yeah, as an economist, I, I must admit, I was very sympathetic to this part of the story. Because we do cost-benefit analysis all the time, every day. You know, when I'm speeding to work, I'm doing a cost-benefit calculation what the chances of me being ca caught by a cop or having a wreck versus the benefit of – it may be a poorly informed, you know, cost-benefit calculation. But we are always doing this, and this is just taking it to the next level. It's a huge advance. It's a, I think it's an enormously – some people have misread – uh, my account, uh, my summary of, of this <laughs> uh, as an attack on cost-benefit analysis. And I want to be clear that the contrary is true. Yeah. I think that cost-benefit analysis is an enormously valuable technology that has greatly improved policymaking. But precisely because of its importance, I think that it is necessary and appropriate for us to discuss exactly how it is done and by whom and on what terms. Now, does all parts of the government use cost-benefit analysis now? There are some types of regulation that are explicitly shielded from cost-benefit okay. analysis. So, for example, the Clean Air Act, it's written into the Clean Air Act that the government can't consider the costs. Uh, and there's uh, a lot of active litigation and movement about the extent to which uh, clean air regulation is actually shielded from cost-benefit analysis. But there are still some types of rulemaking. Uh, that are that are shielded from it. Uh, also, you know, the existing laws don't bind, for example, the Federal Reserve in its regulatory functions, although the Fed has independently committed now uh, to perform cost benefit analyses. So it's not yet universal. I think in general, we're still moving in that direction. Uh, but we're not all the way to that point. Okay, well, our time is coming to an end. Any parting thoughts, any, any wisdom you'd give to all the economists out there as they may be the, you know, the next participants in the next Economist Hour? I, I think more than to the economists. I, I just, you know, the point, the reason that I wrote this book was that I want people to grasp how central economics has become to our society, how important the decisions are that are made by economists, and by beginning to understand that, to take ownership of it and, and to participate uh, in these debates about uh, what rules we should have, what we want from markets, and how we get that. Okay, with that, our time is up. Our guest today has been Benjamin Applebaum. His book is The Economist Hour, False Profits, Free Markets, and the Fractured Society. Be sure to get a copy. Ben, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.